I just got introduced to our speaker, and uh, Mark's told me a little bit about him. He did a little uh, time at the university since 1987. He's very well spoken about vaccines, and I don't think I need to say anything else because he'll explain it all. And we're all very big on vaccines for some reason right now because we've been thinking constantly about them in the last three years. Thank you. Um, obviously enough, this has become a topic of, of very broad interest in, in the last few years, as was already mentioned. Um, I, I wanted to, to take this on partly because I, like I think a lot of us, have been very concerned by the kind of ill-informed resistance to vaccination that we've seen over the last couple of years since the vaccine was first developed for COVID. Um, there's a long history of, of trouble over vaccines. Uh, there's a kind of a back and forth uh, in terms of vaccine requirements. Um, they, they fade if there's no epidemic or pandemic in our case um, over a fairly lengthy period of time. And then when an emergency comes along, uh, firmer uh, rules are put in place. And this has been true for um, ever since the, the smallpox vaccine was developed in the late 18th century. So um, there's, a, there's a history here that, that will sound, I think, fairly familiar along the way, at least at a few points. Um, I talk about evolution here largely because uh, one of the key factors that we've had to deal with with COVID-19 is that it's been evolving as, as we go along. It's an RNA virus. Their reproduction is a little sloppy. Uh, and so the genes are changing all the time. And under the, the rules of natural selection, uh, variations that are a little bit more infectious or a little bit more resistant to our body's responses um, our immune system responses, um, those start spreading faster than the other ones and pretty soon they take over the whole business. Um, and that's a scary thing to watch, right? Because here we are developing the tools to fight the last virus and there's a new one coming along um, every once in a while. Uh, and, and so I think evolution's an important thing to keep in mind here. We were lucky with smallpox, by the way, that vaccine just kept working. Um, it didn't change very much. Um, trust, of course, is a very big issue here. Um, I suspect most of us here, if not all of us, have enough trust in the medical system to actually get a vaccine that's recommended by our doctors and by other um, significant medical figures. Um, but that said, we've seen a lot of resistance and a lot of complaints, some of them from someone we can all think of quite readily right now, I think. Um, and, uh, and that's disturbing, that's damaging, that's very, very harmful. Misinformation is, is one thing. It, it's out there in the web all the time. It's an easy medium to spread misinformation from. Um, but, um, but what's been happening in this disease has been uh, fatal for quite a few people who, if they were better informed, or if the people that actually managed to make them sick with the disease were better informed, um, wouldn't have died. And, and that's, a, that's a real loss and a real shame. We can do better, and trust is something we need to learn to, in a sense, uh, evaluate and, 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 um, and acquire when it's reasonable to acquire that trust. And, and a lot of people have trouble with that when it comes to putting a needle, needle in your arm. And there's a long history of that in the history of, of smallpox vaccine in particular. Um, and progress. Of course, the progress mostly that I'm interested in here is the progress that takes us um, from vaccines that we had to develop in the case of smallpox, for instance, from closely related viruses um, because we didn't have the capacity to modify the genetics of the, the mainstream smallpox vaccine uh, virus. And, and now we can actually build the things we need and, and, and build them in ways that, that can then be tested and assured to be safer than the original and still good production, uh, protection from the original virus. So 
trust and progress come in to uh, very, very seriously in our recent experiences. Well, I, I want to begin with a disagreement about rationality. Aristotle said, uh, man is the rational animal, which is an interesting thing to say. Um, for the ancient Greeks, we we're talking about ratios here, and they understood ratios in the way that we do in mathematics. Um, but it was also a matter of um, how one reasons. And uh, uh, Aristotle thought we did it pretty well. Freud thought otherwise. Um, according to him, we often don't know why we do what we do, and we often act in irrational ways. And I think, descriptively speaking, that's, that's a pretty good description. <laughs> that, that's what it is to be human. So sometimes I think people are able to think and act in accord with the evidence, our aims and our values, but all too often we don't. So there are the poxes. There was uh, a long time ago a, a great pox and a small pox. Um, we still have the small pox and the great pox, really. Syphilis was the great pox. Um, small pox, of course, was much more deadly. Syphilis is not much fun. <laughs> Not recommended, but, but it, it, smallpox is more likely to kill you in a little while. Uh, survivors include Elizabeth I. Some of you may have seen pictures of her with a very white face. That was meant to cover up some of the scars. Uh, and a court maid cared for her during her illness. She also survived smallpox. Uh, she really basically hid from society for the rest of her life. Both were really badly scarred. In Eurasia, it was everywhere. Eurasia, of course, is you know, this, this one unified bit of land uh, which allows humans to travel very readily, even without big ships. And, and as a result, any disease that emerged anywhere on that land had lots of room to grow and spread. And the disease took advantage of armies and traders and spread with them. So it arrived in the Americas first in about 1520 spread across the Amer Americas from there. I've seen different figures about the percentage of population that was killed, but it was very, very significant. It was devastating. And it, and it took down fairly complex societies that we have remains of today, but were never actually encountered by Europeans. Um, this is a picture of, of uh, some smallpox scars, relatively mild. Some people had much worse outcomes. Sometimes the pustules would just cover the whole face. Um, Mary Montague was the lively daughter of a wealthy family. Um, smallpox scarred her when she was young. She was married to a diplomat. Um, and uh, while in Turkey with her husband on diplomatic duty, she observed women there practicing something that was called variolation. Um, she had her son variolated there. It was a way to protect people against smallpox. Um, the idea was look, you could take a sample of material, ground up scab or, or, or um, a little bit of blood dried out from someone who's had smallpox, and you would do this with people who had a mild case of smallpox. So if there's a, an, a pan, an epidemic that's occurring, and you see patients that are actually doing pretty well, although they are having smallpox, um, then that was a signal to collect some of this material. And the Turks would, and this is fairly widespread, I think, in the Middle East, the Turks would scratch it into someone's arm, and lo and behold, most of those people didn't ever get smallpox. Um, when Mary Montague got back to Britain, um, she managed to have her daughter variolated. It was Ill illegal in the time to variolate. Um, that went back and forth. Um, she managed to have her daughter variolated during an outbreak when nobody was really paying attention. <laughs> um, so her son and her daughter were variolated, and they never had a severe case of smallpox. But that wasn't really all that safe. Sometimes. When you variolated someone, it turned out that they were more vulnerable to, small, to the to particular virus, um, and, and they could get very sick. Or if you selected the wrong sample of smallpox, and it was a very virulent one, again, you were in real trouble. So variolation came to be widely accepted, but it was risky. 
But at the same time, about that time, cow maids were generally known to have, oh, lovely complexions. And, and basically, few of them had smallpox scars. And many of them had had a, a, a more mild disease called cowpox. They were milking the cows. They often got lesions on their hands. Uh, Edward Jenner uh, wanted to see whether having cowpox protected patients from smallpox. So we conducted a little experiment. Uh, I've been on some ethics committees. You would never get away from this with this today. Um, but, you know, at the time, it seemed like a perfectly sensible thing to do. Uh, patients included the son of his gardener. Um, and he inoculated each of these people with material from cowpox pustules. These are just pustules that are typically on the hand of the, whoever was interacting with the cows. And after they were covered, he exposed them to smallpox deliberately. <laughs> and none of them got sick. So, thumbs up. <laughs> About the word, it comes from vaca, which is Latin for cow. And so this is where the word vaccination gets started. Yeah. Here's a cartoon from The Time by James Gilroy titled The Cow Pork or The Wonderful Effects of the New Inoculation. I don't know how many of you can see it, but what you have in the middle is a physician making small cuts in the arm of this woman in a chair uh, so that he can rub in some of the material that's going to give her the cow pox and therefore save her from smallpox. And over on the right side, people are having side effects. That is to say, cows are bursting out of their nose or their face or their buttocks. And, and uh, you know, that's pretty, pretty amusing. <laughs> it's a rather funny drawing, but it also reflects um, a lot about how people felt about it. They were very concerned, uncomfortable with the idea of being scratched with some kind of stuff, or in, in the case of Jenner, we'll see injected with some stuff little, very little later. Um, they, they sort of thought, oh, geez, why, why would I want to do that? So the, the feeling that a lot of people had about our vaccines in the last few years, right, goes back a long way. There's another big step uh, with rabies, of course. It's a much more horrific disease. Um, I believe there may have been a report of one survivor with rabies, but mostly if you really get full on rabies, in fact, I think there was, yeah, it's, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, and it's still with us, unlike, happily, smallpox. Um, Louis Pasteur had worked on uh, chicken cholera for a while, and what he did was he took sick chickens, material from chi sick chickens, and, and he used those samples after letting them to stick around for a while in the lab. Uh, he used those samples to inoculate other chickens. And it turned out that after that, first of all, those secondary chickens didn't seem to get terribly sick. And they proved to be resistant to the cholera. So Pasteur knew he had something going. Um, and he turned to rabies next. And again, he attenuated the virus. He weakened it. Uh, what he did was he would take rabbits that were dying of rabies, take the spinal cord out, and hang it up to dry, leave it in the air for a while. His, his, his hypothesis was that there's, there's oxygen in the air. Oxygen's pretty active stuff. It's probably interacting with what's going on in that spinal cord, and that's what's weakening the virus. Um, at any rate, letting them age. And, and his approach to testing this was pretty similar to Jenner's, except he used animals. So we're getting into something closer to what we think of as modern medical science. Um, in the first human case, what had happened was a boy had been badly bitten by a rabid dog a couple of days before. And that was, and pretty well is now, a death sentence if you don't get treated, if you don't get the inoculation. And what he did was he injected attenuated virus from these uh, rabbit spinal cords um, daily for 14 days into the kid, and he survived. That may have been the first human being to survive rabies. Um, 
So about COVID-19, we move up to the something like the present. Um, this disease first appeared in Wuhan, China, and the initial source is believed to be an animal market in the city. Some people say, no, it's the, the, um, the um, uh, warfare efforts a military um, lab that's in the city that was responsible, but uh, their, their levels of, of confinement are pretty good, and they certainly didn't want to let that loose on the city. So it seems much more likely that it, it, it's a matter of the animal market. Um, makes it a zoonosis, as we say, a disease transmitted from animals to, to humans. Um, and it's what we call an RNA coronavirus because it has little bumps on the outside of the thing which look a little bit, not much, like crowns, sort of stick out a little bit. Um, and in an infection, what it does, of course, is it enters cells, it releases its RNA, which is the code that carries its genetic information, and the cell just follows those. This is your cell, my cell, any human cell. It follows the RNA instructions and builds more viruses, which then escape from that cell and do the same thing again. So you get... Uh, a kind of a geometrical boost in the population of viruses in your body, which becomes a problem. The cell finally bursts, releases them to attack other cells, and, and there's lots of places you can find good information on that story. And so about the vaccines, it was pretty rapidly produced, which led some people to be skeptical and, and maybe even fearful of them, but um, the smallpox vaccine was closely related to the Cobhox vi virus, I know that. Uh, it's different, but still very similar um, today. Um, it's, it's now called Vaccinia. It has its own name because it does have some differences from the original cowpox virus. Um, our COVID-19 vaccines are what we call an RNA vaccine. I guess I just mentioned that. They carry instructions that just build parts of the virus. So this isn't uh, instructions for building the virus. This is instructions for building a component of it. It's that crown bit. Um, and the immune system cells build that, and then they display them so that other immune cells can get a look at what it is that they're supposed to be worried about. Um, and uh, as a result, the immune system is able to develop cells that will attack viruses that display those parts. Say, oh, I recognize you. You're a bad guy. And, and uh, they'll engulf, engulf them. Um, and these produce what's called T-cell immunity in patients. I'm not deep enough into um, the immune system to, to explain much about that, but it does apparently suggest that the vaccine is going to produce a long-term immunity. Uh, the crown thing is, is definitely a good target because it's exposed on the immune cells that the vaccine you know, has been taught to produce, and it plays a role in how the, the virus attaches and injects RNA into our cells. So it's a fundamental part of what makes the virus do what it does. And that means it's kind of limited. It can't change randomly easily. It has to maintain that functionality. So this has been really a fantastic success. Um, We've got updates for new variants. The, the technology has allowed us not just to provide a vaccine, but to improve that vaccine when the, the thing we're vaccinating against actually changed its traits. RNA, vaccine, uh, RNA viruses um, tend to change, have mutations more rapidly than any kind of DNA um, um, virus would. Uh, RNA, the processes are just a little bit less reliable, so they just they misrepresent their genome and pass it on to the next one, and then that, that's a different virus, or a somewhat different virus. <coughs> so as a philosopher, as one of my teachers said, what, what we try to do is we try to bring things together. There are a lot of ways we have of thinking about the world. There are a lot of ways of thinking about ourselves. And, and what the job of philosophy is, is to try to take all of that information, all of those different perspectives on, and on knowledge of ourselves and the world, and make it hang together, which is not always easy, because you, know, you, you might have a theory that works over here and another theory that works over there, and they might not fit smoothly, and you might not be able to understand or develop a theory that somehow or other combines the two and covers all the ground. 
one systematic theory, which is what physicists dream of, right? One systematic theory that explains actually everything. Very ambitious project. Anyhow, about anti, oh, uh, about anti vaxxers. Um, resistance to vaccines began with the first vaccine. Many people refused that smallpox vaccine. Some took the funny old cartoon a little too seriously. Um, and that came and went. When there was an epidemic on, often the rules got a lot tighter and, and people were basically required to get vaccinated. Uh, I was required to get vaccinated as a kid entering the U.S. on an Italian ship. We were moving from Halifax to New Jersey. And I already had a smallpox vaccination, but um, we didn't have the documents. <laughs> so I had to get it done, my sister too, uh, again, to make sure that we could get into the U.S. where my father was working. Uh, mandates and quarantines and other measures like that are often imposed during outbreaks of a disease like smallpox. Um, historically, there's always some resistance to that. Some people don't want to be vaccinated. It's an interesting basic psychological fact. Some people are very uncomfortable with it. You can pass that along to some extent by talking to people, but I think some of it is partly just character and your approach to the world, how you feel about trusting in, in other people's knowledge. Uh, these mandates are often loosened or dropped after uh, an epidemic. Uh, and of course, there are lots and lots of false claims about the dangers of vaccination. And that's not unique to what we've just gone through at all. That's been going on from the beginning. Uh, many people are uncomfortable about them, as we saw in the car too. That's the first vaccine that we actually used significantly, at least. Um, and, and it was opposed by quite a few people who just weren't comfortable. So there are questions here about something broadly you could call social psychology. It's, it's that kind of issue. Um, who is it that is developing and spreading misinformation about vaccines? Why do they do that? What makes vaccine denial, the ref refusing to take it, the kind of conspiratorial claims that they make or theories that they develop, um, who's attracted to that kind of thing? Why do they feel that way? Why do they respond that way? There's, there's a woman named Naomi Wolf who's a fairly well-known uh, author. She actually uh, worked with um, um, high levels of the U.S. government. Um, um, yeah, at any rate, with the, shoot, I'm forgetting the name of a, of a fairly recent vice president, which is embarrassing, but anyway. Uh, um, she claimed that Pfizer knew by April 20th, 2021, that babies had died or been severely ish injured by the COVID vaccine. Um, there's a serious response you can find at healthfeedback.org on this. Um, and a, and a U, U, UK broadcaster was found to have breached the broadcasting code because they let her do this on screen, on air, and neither the host nor the broadcaster offered any challenge. They just let her say it. Um, Wolf was suspended by Twitter uh, for tweets making the same claim. Of course, she's now reinstated by, by the, the great leader, Elon Musk. So here's a, something that philosophers like to talk about. This, this thing we do, we call, or this thing we are, a rational animal. Uh, a big part of being rational is learning to separate wheat from chaff. And, and I think the internet has, has, has made that more important than ever, actually. Um, we, we have access to all kinds of sources. There, aren't, there isn't much in the way of, of, of management of those sources or, or careful labeling of those sources in terms of their reliability and, and uh, the views that underlie the things that they're displaying online and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a real challenge here. We need to learn how to resist dangerous and misleading claims, not just as individuals, but of course as a, as a wider society. There's a lot of bad information out there. And, and if you're looking for a point of view that you already kind of lean towards, it's there. It's waiting for you. So you might ask, why am I so confident about vaccines? 
Why am I confident more generally about established medical views and um, um, standards regarding vaccines, regarding va medications, healthy and unhealthy habits. Um, I remember Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I think, talking about um, um, the value of high fat, <laughs> uh, high fat diets in, in, you know, it's really the best thing for you. Of course, that was back in a time when we were a little clearer about the risks of, of taking in fats, but in large quantity. At any rate, um, there is this question. If you don't already know the truth, how can you tell what's reliable and what's not? Who's reliable and who's not? Well, medical statistics are helpful. Of course, if you want to go down the rabbit hole, you can say, oh, that's all fake. But, but you know, that would be difficult, actually, to do in a multi-person um, exchange of information with people gathering information, other people gathering it alongside them, using similar methods and so on and so forth. It's, somebody's going to really stand out if they start saying things that don't really accord with what the results are. So we can work as teams and try to keep the crazy down a bit. Um, medical statistics in this case show strong correlations between being vaccinated and being less likely to catch COVID or, or to have severe disease if they do catch COVID. But of course, statistics could be faked in some countries. Maybe they have been. Um, and as I say, this, this kind of worry, if we start worrying about information at that level, the philosophical skeptic just says, you don't know anything. Sorry, <laughs> that's the way it is. And, and I know some people who almost have that attitude, but I don't. The question is, when and, and what about should we, when should we be skeptics? What should we be skeptics about? How do we sort of make our way through today this immense body of information that's out there in the world that we can stumble across, some of it very unreliable, some of it absolutely reliable, some of it in between. How do you figure that out? Well, I like science as a starting point. It has a pretty strong track record. Um, when you look at Newton's gravity, right? He found successful corrections to models that explained why the early models didn't fit some observations. And other astronomers did the same. So this is how some of the outer planets were discovered. There were perturbations, strange behavior in the orbits of some of, some of them. And, and you could sort of look and make measurements and search the skies and, and find another planet out there in the right place to have the right influence to make the orbit the way it is. And you can't even begin to do that without precise observations. So this was a pretty nice field building with observational methods on the one hand and investigations and calculations from Newton's theory on the other hand. And it worked beautifully for quite a long time. Um, but there was one problem that was recognized fairly early and was very, very much at the center of focus, I suppose, in the late 19th century into the early 20th century. And there just was no Newtonian solution for it. This was the orbit of Mercury around the sun. Um, and it just didn't behave according to Newtonian rules. There was no model that really would do that job properly. And, and uh, general relativity solved it. People had proposed other planets maybe inside the orbit of Mercury, even closer to the sun. And they tried to build models like that that would account for these discrepancies in, in, in Mercury's orbit. And they just couldn't really make it work very well. But uh, general relativity definitely did. So as in this case, with a worry about a theory that's extremely well established, Newtonian physics, um, we need to be skeptical when serious problems don't go away. That's one of the clues. This problem with Mercury just wouldn't go away. But on the other hand, skepticism can go way too far. Uh, Descartes famously basically decided, as he put it, to deny what his senses seemed to tell him, deny his uh, whole world view as far as he could. And the only way he could get out of it by, was by finding the idea of God in his head and then saying, well, the idea of God basically is just God existing a certain way. And Therefore, uh, I couldn't have invented it, and therefore it's got to be really God who put it there, and now we know that God's not a deceiver, and yeah, that, that's the Cartesian argument. Um, interesting. 
Anyhow, we need to be skeptical. Uh, Descartes uh, write about that, but we don't want to be too skeptical. And if you start to be a selective skeptic, where you say, I don't like this idea, I'm going to raise every possible objection to it, and I'm going to ignore any evidence that seems to support it, then again, you're in deep trouble. That's a fairly common thing in politics, I think. Uh, <laughs> success counts. I, I'm a bit of a pragmatist, which is a philosophical tradition that's sort of rooted in North America and the US and can, to some extent Canada too. Um, vaccines helped bring COVID-19 under control and they saved many lives. But you might say, why are you so confident, Brown? Um, couldn't public statistics be falsified? Uh, to make it look as though the vaccine worked. This is deep vaccine you know, inter interference in all of the information sources we could possibly have. I can imagine that, but I think it's much less likely. It, you know, you're talking about a massive conspiracy. And conspiracies work a lot better when there are just a few people involved. Medical records from countries around the world show the vaccinated were less likely to get COVID-19. And they were less likely to have a severe case if they had, if they did get it. And they show regions and countries with higher vaccination rates did better than comparators with lower vaccination rates. So there. <laughs> That's, that was the ending point. And I think Thank you very much. Uh, if people want to ask questions, they can come and line up here. We ask them to be, we ask them to be uh, polite and to the point and not get too long on the podium. Um, and I, I think he might even answer things about horse deworming. Uh, I have two short questions. One isn't on isn't untreated syphilis ultimately fatal? Uh, yes, usually so, yeah. Okay, so it's not really less serious, it's just that we've got a treatment for it. Yeah, and, and it's about how fast it proceeds, too. Okay. I can't hear you. Name? Sorry. And it, it, part of it is that, that um, smallpox killed you fairly quickly, um, um, whereas um, yeah, syphilis, syphilis mm -hmm. takes a long time. So, you know, you get to deal with your misery for, for a longer period. All right. Um, apparently, he said I, my, I didn't say my name clearly, Maureen Hawkins. And my second question is, um, why can't we develop a vaccine to prophylactically save us from rabies instead of going through all those shots after we get bitten? That, that's a good technical question uh, that I don't have a direct answer for. Um, I think I, c I can imagine a number of reasons. I, if there's a physician here who knows a little bit more about it, uh, I'd appreciate that. But uh, one thing could be that, that the disease is, is so serious that um, there's risk associated with the vaccine, right? And, and it's a pretty nasty disease. So if, if it gave you some of those symptoms, you might actually feel that for the rest of your life. But that's speculative for me. Hi, uh, I'm Tony Pargida. Thanks, Bryson, for the presentation. Um, you touched on the question of who spreads um, anti-vax disinformation and why do they do it. it? It's the why that really interests me, and particularly, I wonder if you could comment on why the avidity with which uh, anti-vaxxers seem to be dedicating their lives to this issue when they could simply not get vaccinated themselves and, you know, their personal issue is solved. Why are they so avid and why, why does that tie in so well with many other right-wing issues and perspectives on the world? That, that's a very broad sociological question. Um, and and I, I do have, I guess, some thoughts about it. Um, there, there's a motive, as I said, in, in just the sort of general sense of ick. I, I don't want to have that done to me. I don't want to get an injection. Um, and then on the other hand, there's um, a kind of a, 
a discomfort with anything that involves, you know, actually doing something to your own body. Having somebody else do something to your own body is, is very personal. And, and we're pretty choosy about uh, who we let in in that way. Um, so I, I suspect that the idea that, that somebody you really don't know is just some professional is going to come up and put a needle in you <laughs> is, is, is something that triggers a fair bit of, I don't know, more than caution, uh, large hesitancy. And, and then if there are other people out there who feel that way, who want to spread some misinformation about it, you can justify, right, that feeling of yours by saying, well, these vaccines aren't any good or there's no good reason to trust them anyway. And then you can feel comfortable because you're uncomfortable with getting the vaccine. Anyhow, that, that's broadly spectacle, speculative. My name is Klaus Jericho. Uh, I, I find this is a fascinating social subject. And I'm really interested in public, public health public health, not individual health, but public health. So I asked my sister and my nephew in Halifax, and they're both staunch anti-vaccinates, and they're only ones in the family. So it has caused a lot of difficulties. Uh, and I asked her, Renata, supposing you are the Minister of Health, what recommendations would you make to control a virus which we really don't know how serious it might become. And she says, well, I would use ivermectin. <laughs> so, ivermectin. But I mean, she is, she is a rational lady. Uh, she's my sister, she is not stupid. <laughs> and, 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 I, I was speechless. I was absolutely speechless. You? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, but this relates to this further question about compulsory rabies vaccination. Can you imagine the, the public outcry about that one? <laughs> so this relates to my question, so Bryson, and thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, is, um, you didn't mention this word freedom. <laughs> say something about freedom and vaccination. I'm tempted to say freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, there are all kinds of uh, tangles around the word freedom, and it's because it's used ideologically. It, it's about how you feel about things. Um, I'm much more concerned about my freedom to say things in front of a microphone um, that I believe and provide arguments and, and argue back and forth over those things. That, that to me, that's freedom. Um, and freedom to leave a job as well as to take a job if you find one that suits you. And so on. Th those are freedoms that are very worthwhile. Um, the freedom not to get a prick in your shoulder when the result of that is that you are no longer going to be a point in the spread of an infection, a participant in the spread of that infection. That's something that I'm sociable enough to say is worthwhile. I'm, I'm not crazy about getting vaccinated. It's, you know, it takes time and, and you get a little prick and I, I don't really care about such things. I've hurt myself enough <laughs> by now that it doesn't feel like much. But, you know, I understand it's, it's, it's not something you'd bother doing if there weren't a good reason for it. And, and there are two ways for people to think about that, of course. They can say, oh, well, there's a good reason to do it, so I'll do it. That's, I think, most of us here, maybe all of us here. Um, and then there's the, I don't want to do that. So go away, I won't do it. And uh, yeah, I, I, we sometimes describe that as childlike, but it, it, it's often worse in adults. So I'll leave it there, maybe. Bev Mundell Atherstone, Terry, let me go first because my question's about freedom. So I'm really curious um, how it is that Daniel Smith and the UCP and um, previous, the previous Premier Kenny were so adamant about freedom for people who were doing things that their government thought 
was right. But now when it comes to people who are suffering from addictions to various uh, opioids brought in from other countries to poison our people, that she wants to take away their freedom and put them into a rehab when we know the research is very solid that you have to be willing to go into rehab for it to actually work. Can you talk about that dichotomy? Um, I, I think I mentioned that um, Aristotle's definition of man as the rational animal seems dubious to me. Um, it's, it's an interesting bit of psychological sort of mystery, I guess. Um, we have um, this notion of, of human rationality, um, and, and some people took it very, very seriously. Certainly some philosophers have taken it very seriously as a fundamental trait of human beings. I think it's more or less accidental. It's developed alongside our evolution. I'm a little bit more um, evolution-oriented than, than independent mind-oriented in my thinking about how we think. And, and uh, people don't like intrusions on their sort of personal space. And uh, you have to reach a kind of, uh, I guess, concession with people. They have to make a kind of concession to accept, for instance, a needle in the shoulder. And, and so I think that that makes it much more tempting to believe reports that say, you don't need that, you shouldn't have that. Gee whiz, now I've really got a justification for being a bit of a baby about this. So. <laughs> <clears throat> My name is Terry Shillington, and thank you very much for a very thoughtful presentation. Uh, <clears throat> I'm intrigued about uh, the distrust that is around, and uh, you may not agree, I have the impression this goes in waves, and that when I was a child getting mump uh, and uh, smallpox and vaccinations, there was not that distrust around in the community. Uh, there seems to be great distrust nowadays. Uh, would you care to reflect about that and where this distrust comes from and uh, should throw a pearl of wisdom on it? Um, I guess one thing that could well have contributed to that earlier, some time ago now, um, um, confidence and willingness to, to take up a vaccine when it's offered to you or to, to do other things that, that apparently the country wants you to do that maybe weren't first on your list. Um, I think the, uh, the recency of World War II could have contributed to that. Uh, there was a kind of very deep-seated collective uh, activity and, 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 um, and plot or plan to, uh, to achieve something very important. And, and, and we did achieve it. And I think that may have built a, a higher level of kind of general social um, unity. Uh, and a greater level of, of willingness to do as the government asks you to do, um, as you did when you were selected as a young man to join the army and get out there and fight. Um, so I think that kind of sacrifice as an example may have contributed too to the willingness to accept vaccines. But um, there, there are other elements here uh, socially. It's a very complicated thing and I, I don't know a lot about the the um, sort of analyses that may have been done about, you know, how socially can we distinguish between people who uh, are against vaccination and refuse it, and, and those of us that are quite ready to get a vaccine and trusting in the medical system and, and the science that's led up to those vaccines. So I hope that is helpful. So my name is Mark Gettle, and I'll follow up a little bit on the trust thing. You know, we trusted tobacco companies who pushed tobacco fully knowing that it's addictive and very terrible uh, health hazard. Then we have food companies pushing sugary uh, dr drinks and all kinds of foods that we know are bad and yet they're still pushing it. And then we even had the big pharma pushing opioids now that, that were even prescribed by doctors and caused a horrible problem of opioid uh, uh, addictions. 
So one of the problems, I think, is that we are losing trust in corporations. And of course, Big Pharma is a corporation. And I've heard so many people saying, COVID was created by Big Pharma so they could sell all this vaccine and make billions of dollars. So I think this is one of our problems. And I don't, would you like to comment on the trust in corporations and big business? Well, big business has made a big contribution to that problem, I have to say, <laughs> as you mentioned with respect to vehicles. Um, it, it really is um, it, it's frustrating um, that, that um, people would take that sort of learned experience about businesses and the way in which they will cheat and put people in danger and so on. Um, my parents bought back seat belts for a 1965 wagon, Dodge wagon. A long time ago, they had to buy those as extras because only, only front seats got seat belts required. Uh, so <laughs> these kinds of issues have come up for a long time. Safety glass, heck, in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, vehicles too was a, was a big deal. And again, you had to actually squeeze the companies get, to get them to do it. Um, so uh, we, we have a real problem with the motivational signals that society delivers to different organizations and different individuals. Um, and, and I think that uh, the corporate sector has a lot to answer for. Um, so do some ec educational practices. Well, that, that's a real, um, um, what should I say, tar baby. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can't add much to what you said, Mark. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bryce, and for a really uh, informative um, talk. It really has uh, a lot of food for thought there for us. Thank you. My name is Lori Schultz. My question is really around democracy, uh, and the concept or def how people define democracy. Um, for myself, my dad being a World War II veteran and thinking of his time over in Normandy, picking up living in dead bodies with or without limbs. You know, I always understood that that was about, you know, he and, and those fighting World War II or World War I, as it were. It was about ensuring that he could come home to a country that had rights and freedoms, but responsibilities. And in, throughout this whole COVID, time, I'm, I'm learning that people have a totally different understanding of democracy than I do. I, nobody is speaking, or at least I'm not hearing people speak about responsibility. Now, you know, injecting, having something injected into your body, I can, I can see an argument in that, um, but anti-mask, or you know, masking, Distancing, those are clearly responsibilities. Personally, uh, vaccination for myself is also something that I consider my responsibility. But I'm wondering if you could talk to, where have we gone hi historically or, and currently with the whole concept of what our responsibilities are today? Um, yeah, if you could comment on that. Well, I'm, I'm sure most of us remember uh, a, so a, a line from a song, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Um, and in this case, of course, um, dialogue and, and discussion and, and the use of freedom in, in talking about these issues has, has been an abuse of freedom. It's been um, a sort of self-indulgence. And I, and I guess, you know, in a consumer society, if you can build that kind of psychology, <laughs> Uh, profits may go up, at least temporarily, uh, but, but the, the inculcation of a sense of responsibility to others that may include doing things that you yourself don't find very pleasant, whether it's a needle jab or, or paying taxes, um, it, it's, it's a, a difficult problem because we, we've, um, we live in a society, I think still more so to the south of us, where um, there really is a kind of worship of the individual and, and a reluctance to recognize how much each of us is dependent on communities. And that's crazy for human beings, biologically. We're obligate social animals. You set, well, there's a, 
a short limerick by Edward Gorey. The, the hermit lives among the boulders, his only garment but a sack. It's not a, not a limerick, anyhow. Uh, by slow degrees his reason moulders, the sun has long since burnt him black. That's the person out there on their own. That's what it's like not to be part of a society. And, and um, when people talk about freedom, that's, that's freedom, right? Nobody, nobody making him do anything. And, and that's not a life worth living, either. Maureen Hawkins again. Uh, again, thank you, Bryson, uh, for proving despite current ideology, that the humanities are worth studying <laughs> as a philosophy professor. But my question is, could a lot of this skepticism and eager grabbing on to um, conspiracy theories and so on be partly biological? I've read a fair bit that self-proclaimed conservatives tend to have a large and enlarged amygdala, which processes emotions, including fear. And self-proclaimed liberals have more activity in the anterior circulate, I um, can't remember the, the full term, which, which makes decisions but also processes emotions. Um, and it seems like the anti-vaxxers tend worldwide, I'm not just talking about here, to be conservatives. Uh, and that conservative parties worldwide seem to be pushing things to be afraid of. Could that be what's kind of pushing so many people over the edge into doubting everything and being sure that there are deep states doing terrible things to people and all the rest of that? <laughs> well, I, I'm not an expert on the neurological stuff. That's a, that's a pretty complicated field, although, of course, at the U of L, you do know some people who are about that stuff. Um, sociologically, I think that uh, there is something really perverse in the fact that uh, this kind of, of individualistic freedom uh, attitude uh, towards society at large is, is present in such numbers at a time when socially we are, you know, depending on sources and material and uh, knowledge and technology that is being developed and, and traded all around the world. It's, it's not just, you know, being a Canadian or being a, a Leta Pontian, as my um, um, Latinist friend once said about Lethbridge. Um, um, it, it's, it, it seems that the, the, the scale of our society and, and the ways in which information is shared, uh, where by information I just mean bits as opposed to true content, um, is, is generating some of these problems. And, and, or contributing to them at least. But I think there's, there's something fundamental underneath that has to do maybe with something that we could identify neurologically, but that, that's, that's, to me, that, that's still very speculative. And I think it's pretty clear, at least to me, that my upbringing had a big impact on how I think about these things. Um, my parents were definitely a bit left-leaning against the Vietnam War when we, when we were living in the US. We were always Canadians, but uh, at any rate, that, that was, uh, an interesting experience uh, to have those views in the context of a, an American educational uh, experience where a lot of people didn't share those views. Uh, and, and, it, and it's, so I think a, a large part of it is cultural. Uh, and, and, and cultures tend to, if you like, spread. Features of cultures tend to spread within the culture. So, uh, you know, th we're talking about something very complicated. I wouldn't be surprised if neurobiology comes into it, but I, I wouldn't be surprised to find that that's a, just a small part of the puzzle. That makes sense. Thanks. <clears throat> Hello, my name is uh, Knut Peterson. Uh, some people in the world have speculated that 
this disease, COVID-19, was not serious enough in terms of if you didn't get vaccinated, you would probably die. I just wonder if you could speculate uh, a little bit on that in, in, in the context of uh, natural selection, which ruled the world for many, 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 many years. Uh, you could take, for example, the rapid population in Australia. Every few years, they, they all die off, except for the very strong that can survive that particular disease. <clears throat> I wonder if you could speculate on the vaccine hesitancy if, in fact, you were probably going to die if you didn't get vaccinated. Well, that would certainly put people to the test. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you have to be quite an anti-vaxxer if, if everybody who gets the disease actually dies of it. Smallpox was pretty bad that way. Um, and it left marks on people, pretty bad marks on people who who'd actually survived it. So there, there really was strong motivation to, to do something, almost anything, to avoid getting it. Um, in this case, you know, there were a lot of people that, that, well, there are a lot of people that treat childhood diseases as though they want to spread them to other children and acquire, quote, natural immunity rather than get a vaccine. And, and they don't appreciate that, you know, there's a significant percentage of cases that can get very serious. And, and the vaccine is a lot safer as a result of that, that risk. So, yeah, I, I, I feel sort of at sea about the, the, the harder question of, of how we, how these different inter factors influence individual people. I certainly see a, a, a high level of, of um, ideology being part of the story. It's people with a certain ideology, but of course you can turn that around and say causally maybe they have that ideology because. Um, so it, it, this is the sort of thing that would require a very serious study all the way down. But uh, um, clearly we have serious problems and, and I, I hope uh, that we can make some progress on them. I'm pleased, fairly pleased with the overall uptake of the vaccine that we've been uh, enjoying in the last couple of years. And, and, uh, and I hope that, that that will carry some weight with people over time. But the differences in character and differences in, in social attitudes across countries and all of those things are just uh, very rich things to try and process. And when you start thinking about complicated situations and how they respond to them, it gets extremely difficult. I'm Bach. I'm Bev Mundell-Atherstone. Thank you, Bryson, for trying to synthesize what's going on as a philosopher and tell us, explain to us some of the things that are enigmas of our time. So I'm going to ask you something about freedom. And it's kind of like, it's freedom and beliefs. And there's so many people who don't, didn't believe that there was global warming. And now we find that within the next five years, we will be overshooting the target of 1.5 um, degrees Celsius rise in our atmosphere since the uh, Industrial Revolution. At what point does our freedom um, end, and we're, we're kind of talking about responsibility, but also in terms of when we're looking at the whole world catching on fire and, and fire tornadoes and what our brave fire people are doing up in the north, um, at what point do we say this is enough? Well, um, perhaps unfortunately that's something that would be a political act. And, and that means that getting it to happen is, is very difficult, especially when you're talking about countries around the world which are independently making their own decisions about these things. So I agree, it, it, it's a very disturbing time. And, and COVID, to some extent, has been a distraction more than anything else from the problem that is likely to affect us for hundreds of years in the future. And um, I have uh, some good friends who are very interested and active in, in uh, climate um, discussions and climate science. 
and, uh, and we know that, that we are in serious trouble already because, of course, at any time the average temperature of the Earth now is less than what it would be if we just stuck with the present level of carbon, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because we haven't quite caught up with the, with the um, addi additional energy that has to build up before the temperature gets up and the, the heat capacity of the oceans is, is significant. <laughs> Um, so um, we're, we're not even where we will be if we keep the levels of CO2 and other greenhouse gases at present level. Um, we're going to be at higher levels given our present level for those gases. And of course it continues to increase and we have continued um, subsidization in various ways of uh, the industries that produce those things. So we're, we're, we're going in the wrong direction and uh, I, I don't know what it will take politically to convince people who, who see it as a living and as a good living and as an entitlement, as Albertans and, and for that matter, Saudi Arabians, um, to, to continue to make money out of that. And, uh, well, I don't know. But the, the last thing I have to say there is we're in trouble. <laughs> As a moderator, I'm actually going to do two questions. If we look around the audience, uh, people here will know they got secondary problems from viral illnesses. Uh, if we're old enough, some people know about shingles. Uh, polio. My father had uh, polio as a 14-year-old teenager. He was left with a defect for his whole life. My sister returned to grade two school in Kimberley with several of her classmates dead and one on an iron lung. In 1977, I put a lady uh, permanently on a respirator at age 23 in Newfoundland. So my question on this part is, if we get to nasal vaccines or spray vaccines where we don't have to put a needle in yourself, do you think we'd have more uptake? Yeah, I, I think that's likely to be true. Uh, I suspect that the, the real hardline vaccine deniers are still going to say, no, no, no. Um, so that I, I suspect that the movement will carry on, but the population that, that constitutes it will get smaller. Um. The official question is, <laughs> as a... <laughs> Um, do you have a takeaway thought for our audience? I think I mentioned that Aristotle described us as the rational animal, and, and I'm prepared to dispute that. Uh, but it seems that we have the capacity to develop rational, evidence-based views on a pretty wide range of issues. That's what we are, broadly speaking, trained to do uh, as academics. And while some issues remain in dispute within academia, you will not find any competent medical academic declaring that these vaccines, or maybe, maybe you would, maybe 0.1%, 0.01%, would say something nasty about the vaccines. But, but I suspect we're talking about a, the kind of minority that you really can effectively ignore, which unfortunately we can't do when it comes to anti-vaxxers today. Uh. Thank you very much. That was delightful. And thank you for our audience for being here. If you found our late arriving donation jars, please make Bev happy. <laughs>